Well, we have covered a lot of ground in just these three chapters, right? I hope that you read these three chapters. I'm not going to like call you out and ask you if you did individually, but if you didn't, I really, really want to encourage you, go back and read, especially chapters three and four. She does such an incredible job talking about that child-centered approach and talking about how we pursue happiness in and through our kids. And I really, I really can't state it any better than she did. I really don't have a lot to add to what she said. So I really want to encourage you, go back and read those two chapters if you haven't. Because today where I really want us to spend our time is on chapter 5, talking about technology. So I have some questions for you. How do you feel when you look at your phone and you see the little red battery symbol? And it's only like one o'clock in the afternoon. What about when you're having an important conversation but you feel or hear your phone buzzing? And you tell yourself, no, 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 I shouldn't reach for it right now because this conversation is important. What about when you realize that no one has liked or commented on that picture that you posted two hours ago on Instagram? Or what if you realize you left your phone at home? <laughs> Anybody? Did you know there's an actual word for that now? The fear of being without your cell phone. It's called nomophobia. Okay? Have you experienced that? I have. How many of you turned around to go back and get your phone? Because it's, it's our lifeline to a lot of things these days, right? Well, as a 13-year-old girl put it very bluntly in an interview with The Atlantic, the author is, is telling about what the young girl said, and she said, she told me she had spent most of the summer hanging out alone in her room with her phone. The girl said, that's just the way our generation is. We didn't have a choice to know a life without iPads or iPhones. And I think we like our phones more than we like actual people. That's pretty insightful for a 13-year-old, right? And so American adults spend about six hours a day looking at a screen, with more than half of that being on a mobile device. And Apple recently confirmed that its device users unlock their phones at least 80 times a day. 80 times. That's as many as six or seven times an hour. And that's if you're putting it away when you go to bed. And these stats are all before you throw a pandemic and a quarantine into the mix, right? Who got your screen time report from Apple and you were like, whoa, things have changed in March, April. A study from Microsoft did have some good news and said on the positive side, our ability to multitask has drastically improved in the mobile age. But the downside was that it also indicated that our attention span is now shorter than a goldfish. How encouraging is that? A goldfish is nine seconds, and we are now coming in at eight seconds. So screen time is altering both our actual brain structure and its function. But the problem is <laughs> we know all of this, right? When we talked about technology a few years ago in Bloom, we had to kind of be convinced that this was a problem, that we had a problem. But we know we have a problem. We know that this amount of time that we're spending on screens is not healthy. We know it's hurting us, yet we continue to do it. I continue to do it. And that is called addiction. Addiction is defined as the repeated involvement with a substance or an activity despite the substantial harm it now causes. Because that involvement was or may continue to be pleasurable and or valuable. 
And so what we've learned is that every time we look at our screens, every time we get a like or a comment or a text or even an email in our inbox, we get a little hit of dopamine. The same neurotransmitter that helps us with attention but also causes addiction. And so every time we get a hit of this chemical, our brain is motivated to continue focusing on that screen for longer and longer and longer. We are literally wiring our brains to crave more screen time. And so your inbox becomes kind of like this little portable cocaine dispenser, if we're honest. And the result of this addiction is that, according to the Pew Research Center, roughly four in ten teens say that they feel anxious when they do not have their cell phone with them. How about four in ten adults as well? But 56% of teens associate the absence of their cell phone with one of these three feelings, at least one of these three feelings. Loneliness without their cell phone. That they're upset if they don't have their cell phone. Or that they feel anxious when they don't have their phone. If we want to talk about adults, at the same time, parents of teenagers are admitting that they also struggle 36% admit, admit, they answered honestly, a lot of us don't, right? But they admitted that they spend too much time on their cell phones. And here's the the heartbreaker of them all, 51% of teens, over half of, of teens say that they often or sometimes find that their parent or caregiver is distracted by their own device when they're trying to have a conversation with them. And so it's not just about our kids. We, the adults, have an addiction as well. But the bigger issue is that we know we have a problem, but we're not doing anything about it. So I want to tell you this story of a Saturday morning around our house, and we were doing housework and cleaning around the house, and so you've been there too. I I just got up and put on my grubby clothes and threw my hair up in a ponytail and probably brushed my teeth, but that was about it. And we're just working around the house. And my daughter comes down, and she's like, Mom, I need to go to Walmart because I'm working on this project, and I need something. She's like, right now? She said, yes, because I'm in the middle of my project. I've got to finish it. I said, okay, let me at least go put some shoes on. And so I walk back to my closet and I walk past the bathroom mirror and kind of take a glance. You've done that, right? And sometimes you scare yourself when you do that. And so I kind of took a double take. It's like, whoa. And I asked myself this question. If you've ever asked yourself this question, I'm going to feel better about myself. Hopefully it's not just me, but I asked myself the question of, Am I decent enough to go to Walmart? Okay, it's a, it's a low bar, right? A really low bar. But I'm asking myself this question because that's the state we're in, okay? And so I'm looking in the mirror, and then I start thinking, I've been to Walmart. I've seen a lot of people in Walmart. And actually, if I think about those people, I'm looking pretty good. So I think I'm actually okay to go to Walmart. See, there were some things that I needed to change about my appearance, right? But I justified that I was fine. I don't need to do anything. It's just Walmart. It's just another day. Nobody's going to care. This is what everybody looks like when they go to Walmart on a Saturday. And so what did I do? I put my shoes on and we went to Walmart. And so recognizing that we have a problem is great. It is the first step. But it doesn't actually change anything. We can't just throw up our hands and say, well, this is as good as it gets. This is, this is just kind of how we roll. This is what it is. This is what everybody's doing. Something has to change. And as moms and as parents, we have to get ourselves right first. 
before we can focus on our kids. It's easy to focus on them, right? Kind of a do what I say, not as I do mentality. But we have to focus on ourselves. We cannot ignore our own problems. But here's the thing. Behavior modification doesn't work. Just trying to say to yourself, okay, I'm going to spend less time on my phone. It doesn't work because in order for us to change our behavior, we've got to figure out what's driving it. Because when we understand the why, then we can change that outflow of behavior, right? And so we know we have a problem when it comes to screens and technology and social media. And so now in an effort to make a lasting change, we have to ask ourselves why we have this problem. And I think that that answer is bigger and it goes deeper than what we even realize or want to admit. And that is that I think we are seeking life. We're seeking life from this little phone that we carry in our pocket. We're seeking life that's happy and full and meaningful and easy and satisfied. And you know what? That's what we were wired to have. We were wired to have a full, meaningful, satisfied life. But the problem is we're looking for it in the wrong place. We're looking to our phones to find it. And I think that that is the definition of an idol. Something other than Jesus that we look to for life. I do that. And a lot of times it's looking to my phone. But Jesus in John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And where we get off track is the fact that Satan offers substitutes for what God intended, right? And he wraps them up really nice and pretty and shiny, and they look great. Have you ever been to a restaurant and they bring the dessert tray around and show you the desserts? They look amazing, right? But would they ever hand you one off of the tray and let you try it? No, because the ice cream's like Crisco and the, like, it's not the real thing, but it looks really good, right? And so at first glance, Satan's substitutes look harmless. They look great. They sometimes even look like they might be better than the real thing. But once we take the bait, we find out that it was a trick, a bait and switch. A present with a beautiful wrapping that draws us in only to find out that what's on the inside was a joke. And so I think when it comes to this topic, we're seeking things. We think we're finding them, but what we're actually getting is something different. So let's talk about a few of those things. First, I think we're seeking rest. Who's tired in here? All of us, right? We're seeking rest. We want to break physically and mentally, and so we turn to a screen as entertainment. But instead of rest, we find the cheap substitute of escape. Now, I want you to think about that word escape. If I just say that word, what comes to your mind? Okay, for me, it's the image of like, prison break movie or a, a, a you know some movie where the guy's on the run he's trying to get away from whoever is chasing him he's trying to escape from them that is not restful it's stressful it's full of activity it burns a lot of energy and so instead of getting true rest when we turn to our screens what we get is noise and at first we think it's rest because it drowns everything else out and we use it as a medication to numb the pain or the stress or the, the frustration that maybe we're dealing with. But even when we are resting and scrolling on our phones, our brains are not at rest. And when we, when we legitimately do have a moment of rest through the day, the kids are quiet for a few minutes or they're at school 
or it's nap time, what do we do with those moments? We fill them. 77% of people said that it is true that when nothing is occupying their attention, the first thing they do is what? They reach for their phone. I mean, I, guilty. Guilty, guilty, guilty. Guilty. Because we believe that our devices promise more efficiency and productivity. And so they can help us to get more done. And then we will have more time to rest. But in reality, we're more than ever connected to our work. Maybe that's you or maybe that's your husband. And now instead of leaving the office or putting our work down at home... We carry this little thing in our pocket that makes us ever available and ever connected. And now work becomes a round-the-clock responsibility. Which means that we're more stressed and we're more burned out and we're less rested than ever. And so rest, we desperately need it, but we have settled for this cheap imitation of escape. The second thing I think that we're looking for is relationship, looking for companionship, but we settle for impersonal connection. Sherry Turkle wrote a book called Reclaiming Conversation, and it's a fascinating book. It's long, but it's very interesting. And she says this, she said, computers offer the illusion of companionship without the demands of friendship. I'm going to say that again. Computers offer the illusion of companionship without the demands of friendship. And then, as the programs got really good, the illusion of friendship without the demands of intimacy. Isn't that good? Don't you feel that in our online interactions? I have a friend that, that I grew up with through kind of early high school She lives in Little Rock. I hardly ever see her. But she posts a lot on Facebook about her kids, about her family, about what they're doing. She's got four kids. I've met the oldest one in person once or maybe twice throughout her lifetime, and she's in college now. But I ran into them out somewhere. And you know what I wanted to do? to these three kids that I've never in my entire life met, I wanted to like walk up and hug them. How weird is that? I mean, they would have been like, who is this lady that we've never seen in our lives before? Because I feel like I know them, right? You probably have somebody that you feel that way about, but I don't know them. I've never met them in my entire life. It just feels like I know them. It's an illusion of relationship. And as we look more and more to our devices and digital communication, we communicate less and less face-to-face. Now, sometimes that's convenient, right? A lot of times that's convenient. But it's also a problem because as this happens, we lose the ability to communicate fully. And here's what I mean by that. Have you ever sent a text message or an email that somebody read the wrong way because there's no tone, right? They don't know if you're being real, if you're being sarcastic, and things can get misread because they're missing that tone of voice. They're missing our nonverbal communication. We no longer feel comfortable having a real-life conversation, and our kids don't know how to talk to each other, much less talk to an adult. And maybe you're thinking, oh, Carrie, it's, I mean, it's not that bad. I can still have a conversation with people. But let me ask you this question. If you were going to order dinner tonight and you had a choice of ordering online or calling the restaurant to place your order, what would you do? Sometimes we argue at our house about who gets to call and who has to call and place the order, right? Because we don't like talking to people anymore. 
And this doesn't seem like a big deal when we're talking about placing an order for dinner, but the consequences go deeper than we realize. Because when we stop communicating face-to-face, we lose the opportunity, and our kids especially, lose the opportunity to develop emotional intelligence and empathy. Because empathy is what bonds us to each other. It's what helps us learn to read between the lines. It's what helps us learn how our words affect each other when we speak them. If your child, your, your middle school or teenager sends kind of an ugly text to a friend, my children have done it, they don't see the response of that person. And that's why they do it, right? Because they don't have to deal with the response face to face. But they're not learning how to communicate well with other people. And so that leads it to become more difficult for us to learn how to form true relationships and managing relationships becomes harder. And so that drives us back to our phones because it's easier and then that makes our relationships harder which drives us back to our phones which becomes a never ending cycle. Not only are we not learning how to build relationships, we're missing opportunities to build relationships. You don't go to the grocery store and strike up a conversation in line anymore. You pull out your phone. You don't go to the doctor's office and sit in a waiting room with people who have nothing to do, so you might as well talk to each other. Everybody's on their phone. We turn to our screens to fill these empty times instead of turning to other people. And when we do interact with people, our attention is divided Going back to Sherry Turkle, this is what she says. She calls it continuous partial attention. Continuous partial attention. She said, we are forever elsewhere. Doesn't that just sum it up? That we are forever elsewhere. And it's becoming accepted as the norm. But it's not healthy for us. Relationships, casual and deep relationships, are built in these in-between moments of our lives. They're built when we're in the car, driving around. And now, instead of our kids looking out the window or playing the ABC game, we're on a device. Instead of having random conversations Seemingly about nothing, we pull out our device and we are forever elsewhere. And the bottom line is that instead of finding relationship, we are using our technology to hide from ourselves and to hide from others. And it's killing us. And it's killing our relationships. So we look for rest. We look for relationship. And then thirdly, I think the thing that we're looking for is control. But what we're getting is more anxiety and more addiction. Online communication allows us to mitigate or at least minimize the risk of communicating with someone, right? If I'm going to post something on social media, I can revise and edit my words until they're exactly Right, and they say things the exact way that I want to say them. But when they come out of our mouths, sometimes we say something that we didn't intend, and we have to backtrack and apologize and go through the process of making that right. And so it's much easier for us to go the digital route because we can avoid the conflict. We can avoid the pain of miscommunica- miscommunication. We don't have to engage those hard parts of face-to-face communication We can control when and how much we engage. When we feel insecure or uncomfortable in a situation, we can pull out our new security blanket and stare into the glowing screen and get that dopamine hit. So now we feel comfortable instead of out of place. We can control what we post, what image we present, 
But in doing so, we're then creating this false version, or maybe it's not false, but it's at least incomplete version of ourselves that then we have to live up to. There's a pressure we feel to be perfect, but also hashtag keep it real, right? And so in pursuit of control, in an attempt to lessen our worries and lessen our stress by going to our phones, we only find more anxiety. And we continue to feed the addiction and strengthen it so that we are actually out of control and we are slaves to the devices in our hands. So now that you're like completely beaten down with all of the bad reasons that we look to our devices and you're thinking about how much you, time you spend on your phone, what, what are we going to do about it? What are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to change? Well, first, I want to read to us some verses from Deuteronomy chapter 30. It's verses 11 through 20. And it says, now what I'm commanding you today to make these changes, it's not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. No, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and your heart so that you may obey it. And God says to us, see, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, and to keep his commands, his decrees, and his laws. And then you will live and you will increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But but if your heart turns away and you're not obedient, if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and to worship them, I declare to you this day, that you will certainly be destroyed. I've set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life and he will give you many years in the land that he swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so we have these two choices, and we have to choose life. We have to. So how do we do that? Well, first, we have to realize that we are not fighting a human battle where human power and our own willpower and our own strength can be our weapon. Ephesians 6 tells us, it says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We're fighting a spiritual battle, guys, so we need spiritual strength. We need spiritual weapons because we can't fight that battle on our own. And so first and foremost, we have to invite God in to this process. We have to invite the Holy Spirit in to this area by asking God for help, by saying, God, I know that I have this idol that I'm looking to for life, and I want to lay that at your feet. And I know that it's going to be a battle. I know that it's going to be something I have to do every day, every hour, every minute even, but I need your help. Because God tells us that we don't accomplish things by our own might, but that we accomplish those things by the power of his spirit. But there are some practical things we can do as well, both for ourselves and for our kids. So I just want to give you several things today that you could think about for your own home. First, take an extended break to find out how addicted you are. Maybe you can do that for a month. Maybe you can delete social media off of your phone for a month. October the 1st. Maybe you can't do it that long. Maybe you could do it for a week. 
maybe even just a day, to help you become aware of how often you pick that phone up brainlessly and you just open up Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, whatever your app of choice is, we've got to just become aware of how addicted we are. Second, set no phone times and zones. Make the dinner table a no phone zone. I challenge you to make the car a no phone zone. We didn't do that. I wish we had done that. We got a car when my kids were little that had the DVD player in it, and we made the rule of the only time we watch a movie is when we go out of town. I wish we'd done that with devices. And so I'd encourage you to do that because your kids are just filling that time with noise when you could be establishing relationship with them. Don't miss that. Have a bedtime for devices in your house. It's easy to do for your kids. Do it for yourself as well. If we don't teach ourselves and we don't teach our children how to be alone with nothing to pull out of the pocket and fill their time with, then they will only know how to be lonely. If we don't let them figure out how to be bored, then they never learn how to be still. And if we never learn to be still, then it's going to be very difficult for us to be still before the Lord and have a relationship with him. So set those no phone times and zones. Set time limits. You can do that through settings on your phone. You can get a third-party device like Circle or there's many others that can set... uh, time limits for you and for your kids. Don't go to your phone out of boredom or insecurity. Take a few minutes and just have some empty brain space. When you walk into a room where you don't know anyone, begin to practice the skill of talking to someone that you don't know instead of pulling out that security blanket. Teach your kids good device etiquette and good boundaries. To put their phones away when their friends are over so they can actually engage with each other. To not be on their phone when they're having a conversation with another person or especially another adult. And then finally, put your phone out of sight when you're having a meal or coffee or a conversation with someone. Because get this, studies show that just the mere presence of your phone laying on the table changes what we talk about. You don't even have to be on it. But just the phone laying there in sight changes us. And so above all, I want to encourage you to just be present. Be where your feet are. Take advantage of the in-between moments. It's going to feel awkward at first. You're not going to like this. You need to know that. That doesn't mean you should give up. Your kids are not going to like this. Expect that. Press through. Don't give up in setting good boundaries. Because life and death are literally being set before you. Life and death, guys, of our hearts, of our spiritual lives, of our relationships, it's being set before you and before me and before our children. And so what will we choose? And I'm going to be the first to say this is a problem at my house. It's a problem, and it's hard with teenagers. And so I feel that if you are there with me, it's easier to just turn a blind eye rather than to deal with it, right? It's so much easier. But it's not going away. And so unless we want death 
in our lives and in our relationships, we have to choose to use technology in a way that honors God and in a way that does bring life, in a way that does bring rest and connection rather than just the cheap imitations of those things. And so I just want to close with this verse because I think it's such a good reminder and a good challenge as we think about the idol of our screens and our phones. And that's this, Matthew 6, 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. God, thank you for hard words of conviction. God, this is a huge battle for us as individuals, for our families, for our society at large. God, it is changing who we are. It is changing our hearts and it is changing our minds. So God, we come to you today and we ask for strength We ask for courage. God, we ask for your mindset. And we take this idol and we just, we want to lay it down before you today and admit that we have a problem. And we want to invite you in. We want to invite you into our hearts and to our families and our homes, God. Would you give us the courage to, to change things for ourselves? Would you give us the courage to set good boundaries for our children, for our marriages in this area, God. And we just ask for your strength and your power as we seek life, God. Would we seek it from you? Would you be our treasure, God, so that our heart dwells with you? God, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.